Yoda, Daniel Grievous. Hey everyone, welcome to Tinkering with Tiny Humans. This is my tiny human, Jacob. I have another tiny human, but she's not able to be with us today, but maybe in our next video. And today we are going to make a giant nine foot Lego table um, to add on to this collection of IKEA stuff. So we have three IKEA modules and they've been purchased at different times, so they don't exactly match. And that makes it a little more tricky because our heights are not the same, our depths are not the same, but we are gonna make it work anyway. So Jake, our first step is gonna be to make something that's gonna support our table surface here everywhere. So we want it to be coplanar support. What do you think the word coplanar means? I don't know. Do you know what a plane is? Like a flat surface? Yeah, a flat surface. So a plane is an imaginary surface that extends in all directions equally. So we want the support to be coplanar or touching that plane in every spot. Our first step is going to be to make some marks on the wall and to put some supports there so that it'll be supported at the same height on the front and the back. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this handy dandy tool. It's called a hand masker. This is really helpful for when you're painting so you can put protective paper um, on stuff you don't want paint to be on. But it's also really useful when you're making layout lines on a wall so you don't have pencil marks where you don't want them. So this will apply the tape to the masking paper at the same time, it's kind of magical, watch. And it doesn't have to be perfectly level because we're gonna make a line it is perfectly level. Mm. See, even though that's a little candy wampus, it's okay. And then I'm going to give you a couple pieces of tape so that you can make sure it's not flopping around. So when you tape it down, you want to make sure that you pull it tight against the wall. So when you touch it onto the paper, make sure there's no wrinkles. You want to pull down in a way and attach it to the wall. All right, so our next step is we need to find a way to mark on the wall where all these support points are from. Now, the interesting thing is we know just by looking at this that this is higher than this. So right now, we want the laser to just touch the front edge of this surface and to project on the wall. So this is a self-leveling laser. As long as you don't touch it and as long as it's not too crooked, it will find its way to... Um, flat. So if you leave it alone for a minute, it'll start to level out. Now check this out. If I put my finger here, see how the line is too high? I need you to use this adjustment knob to bring the line down so it's just touching the corner of that cabinet. Basically you do it a little bit and then walk away for a second and let it level. And then try it again and walk away for a second and let it level because it's kind of jiggly. And that looks pretty good. Go check it over there with your finger. See if it's just skimming the top. Yes, it is. Perfect. Okay. So then we're going to make a pencil line that matches up with this and that on the wall. Now you can't put your body in the way of the laser or else it disappears. So you're going to have to hold the pencil off to the side when you make your marks. And I will do the other one. And try not to look directly into the laser because it is not good for your eyes. Now if you don't have a laser, we could do it with a level. Um, either a two foot or a four foot level, we would just let the level rest on the front edge of the cabinet and then let the other edge of the level touch the wall and we would make our marks that way. As long as we ensure that the little bubble is in the middle, it'll mean the same thing. We'll have a straight line on the wall that's coplanar with the cabinet. Having good tools makes the job easier. So if we've got the tool, we're going to use it. Good? Mm -hmm. All right. Now you can take this and we can connect all the dots and make it contiguous. What do you think contiguous means? Mm. It's all connected with no breaks or discontinuities. All right, so you've got a little bit of wonkiness in your line. Well, that's okay. So we're gonna use what we call averaging. So some of your marks are above where the red line was and some of them are below where the red line was. So we're gonna average and we're gonna put the straight edge about in the middle of all of your marks. And if you could draw a straight line across there, I think that'll be pretty good. Wonderful. Great. Perfect. Okay. Ooh, that's good. We averaged out all of the deviations from your marks. Good job. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we need to figure out where the studs are in the wall. Do you know what studs are? Uh, like metal supporters or anything? Yeah, in this wall they are metal supporters. So in a wall, we have studs 
that run vertically, and they either bear the load from the structure above, or they serve as a partition. Some, some walls are load-bearing, some of them are not load-bearing, but the studs are the framing members that go vertically in the wall. And what we need to do is figure out where those studs are, because then we can figure out where we can put a screw or a fastener into our support piece. So we know that there's going to be a stud somewhere around here, because usually a junction box is attached to a stud, uh, but we don't know exactly where it is, so we're going to try using a stud finder. What you want to do is you want to start somewhere where you don't think there is a stud to calibrate it. And the best way to find a metal stud in general is to use a strong magnet. So this is called a rare earth magnet or a neodymium magnet. And you'll notice it'll stick to the wall where there's a stud. We know that there's a stud kind of here. So usually when we know that something is kind of in a position, we put a squiggle instead of a line. And that tells us it's generally there. We also know there's a stud generally here, so we'll put a squiggle there. So we want to start our stud finder somewhere between those two marks to calibrate it. So we press the button, that says it's working. We take a second, we press it again, and that means deep scan. And the deep scan tends to work best with these metal studs. So you'll notice these lights will start to turn on. When it turns solid, that should be the edge of the stud. A stud is roughly an inch and five eighths for metal, an inch and a half for wood. So we're going to do the same thing over here, and then we're going to mark it. You're going to calibrate it off to the side. You're going to come at the stud from this direction, put a mark, come at this direction, make a mark, and you should be good. All right, can you mark this one, please? Find the general area where the stud is, mark it with a squiggle, and then mark the actual stud the studs, please. And studs are usually either 16 inches away from each other or 24 inches away from each other, because that's the standard spacing. Next thing we need to do is we're going to measure the distance between here and here for our support. Give me to the closest inch the space between these two cabinets, please. What do you think the closest measurement is to an inch? 32 inches. 32 inches, that sounds about right. So one thing you can do is you can pull the tape measure out in front of you ahead of time and then put a kink in it and then you can walk this kink back and forth to wherever you need it to go. So I can bump this against the wall, and I can walk that kink into the corner, and I also get 32 inches. Using the magic of pre-cutting, check this out, see if it fits. Excellent, Looking good? Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to get a pencil, and we're going to transcribe those marks on the wall to the support. What do you think transcribe means? I don't know. So scribe means to make a mark, and transcribe means to transfer a mark. So we know that we got a stud here and a stud here. So we're going to put our piece of wood against the wall, and I think I'm going to choose to make the freshly cut side go against the wall, just because I think it's a little prettier. And we're going to hold this up like this, and we're going to mark the piece with what side we're working with. So we're going to say this is the left-hand piece. We're going to make that one the right-hand piece. That way we don't get messed up when we're laying our stuff out. And then I'm going to take a mark here, and I'm going to mark where the stud is on the top. And I'm going to mark where the stud is on the top. And you do the same thing. So put the pretty side of the wood against the wall. And then mark on the yucky side where the two studs are. Where basically where I have an X. This is where the X is. Yeah. Mark needs to go there. Okay. Now we eventually want to drill through the front of this wood. And we could eyeball it, but the fastest thing to do is to use a speed square. So this speed square makes a right angle, and that makes sure that when we move our measurement around the wood, that it stays straight. So now the mark on the front that we're going to drill through is going to be perfectly in line with the one on the top. Cool. All right, so now we're going to drill our holes through here. And check it out. It's not perfect, but if you'll notice, the space between these is about the same. Uh, and that's roughly 16 inches from center to center of the stud. So it's a little bit off, but that gives us a good guess that we're on the right track. So this is an inch and a half wide. 
from here to here. What do you think half of an inch and a half is? Like... Well, if you have an inch and you cut that in half, what is it? Mm, half of an inch? Yeah. And if you have a half and you cut that in half, what do you get? A quarter of an inch? Yeah. So what's a half plus a quarter? That'll be the answer. Three quarters of an inch? Yep. Three quarters of an inch. Good job, buddy. So we need to make a mark at three quarters of an inch, and that will be perfectly in the center. And that mark is right here. Now you don't have to do it for wood, it's more important for metal, but this is an automatic center punch. So this is going to put a little divot in the wood so that the drill bit stays put where we want it. And you just push on it until it makes a snap. And you do it a couple times. See how it puts a divot in there? We want, when we drill through one thing that we're attaching to another, we want the hole through the first piece to be what's called a clearance fit. We don't want the screw to grab, we want it to float through the hole. And that allows us to make sure that this gets pulled up tightly against the wall, and we want an interference fit on the hole that the fasteners are gonna go into in the wall. This hole, or this drill bit, is sized so that it's slightly larger than that screw. So remember, when we drill something, you can use your finger to align it to the hole, and then bring it orthogonal to the workpiece. Do you know what orthogonal means? I don't know. Do you know what a right angle is? Yeah. Yeah, so what's the right angle? 90 degrees. Yep. 90 degrees. So on something like this, it can be 90 degrees in two different axes. It could be 90 degrees this way, or it could be 90 degrees this way, and we want it to be both, and that's orthogonal. Start our drill slowly to get it to start to uh, dig into the workpiece, and then we can speed up if we want to. That hole is sized so that the screw will go through without the threads engaging, and that's what we want. Can you do this one, please? Remember to always keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to fire. I know. Good. And try to run the drill when you remove the bit too. It helps it come out easier. Perfect. Now since this is wood, it's not as critical, but it's still a bad habit for us not to be wearing safety glasses while we are drilling and stuff. So I'm gonna get some safety glasses for us to use. Do you remember the name of this tool? Mm, impact driver? It is an impact driver. And what shape of bit is in here? Uh, Phillips. Phillips. How do you know it's Phillips? Because it looks like a plus. Yeah, plus size. So I'm not a huge fan of Phillips fasteners, but this is what I have. I prefer Robertson or Robertson, depending on where you live, or Torx. Uh, do you remember what Torx looks like? Mm, no. Star shaped. Oh. But both of those are superior to Phillips because they don't cam out, they don't jump out of the fastener. At this point, what I'm going to do is we're going to put the screw in and make sure that we hit what we need to. And then if that's accurate, we'll pull the paper off and then we'll screw this to the wall. The rule when you build a house is that pipes and wires cannot be any closer than one and a quarter inches from the face of the stud. So I picked three inch screws because it's gonna go through one and a half inches of wood plus a half inch of drywall, which means it will never go into the stud more than one inch. When you put a screw in, it goes through the drywall very easily. And if it becomes difficult to put in after it goes through the drywall, that's a good sign because it means you hit the stud. If it goes through easily all the way, that means that you missed the stud and we have to remeasure and figure out how we managed to miss it. All right, that's good. We did good. All right. So I'm gonna remove these. If you want to gently remove the paper. When we take paper off of a painted surface, we want to pull the tape away at a 45 degree angle. So we want to hug the wall and we want to pull it away at a 45 degree angle. If we pull it straight back, we can pull the uh, paint off the wall. Even if it's properly prepared, something happens. So up and away at a 45. We're going to put one coat of tape on the back of here so that if we ever pull this off, all we're going to have to do is fix those two nail holes because if you don't do that, sometimes the paint will bond to the wood and then when you pull the wood off the wall, you get a big chunk of the wall ticking. So I'm gonna put one strip of masking tape here. And this side can overlap a little bit and you'll never see it because the tabletop's gonna go down. Excellent. 
Excellent. All right, so then the only other thing we need to figure out is we know that the front edge of here is coplanar with here, and the front edge of here is coplanar with here, no, but no. this is too low. So what do you think we can do to figure out the height difference? Mm, we give me two different ways. One way is high tech using a laser, and give me a low tech way too. That's not a word. Low tech's a word. Oh, never mind then. Uh, it's the antithesis of high tech. So if we didn't have this laser, how would we figure out how to make the spacer piece over here? Um, Using low tech stuff. You could measure from the floor to here and measure from the floor to there and take the difference. That would be one way. Or we could take a long straight edge and we could put the straight edge across the leading edge and measure that difference. And the last thing we could do is we could take a string. We could pull a string really tight from that corner to that corner and measure the difference. They would all give us the same result. However, since I already did this, I already cut the piece, we should be good to go. And then the final thing is we want everything to be evenly supported. So the wood is going to be touching the front edge here. But what do you notice about how these two faces are put together? Higher than the other? Absolutely. So what do you think we should do about that? We're going to use a shim. Do you know what a shim is? Like a, a small support? Yeah. A shim is anything that fills in the space between two other things that you want to eliminate. So I found some old CDs that are garbage. Run your finger across here. Is that good and level? Yeah. Okay. So if we push that to the back corner, then we know that it's going to take up the same amount of space is that gap over there. So we've got a shim there and a shim there. Do the same thing on the other side of the black cabinet, please. Yeah. All right, so now we're at the exciting spot. We can test it for fit. Super duper. All right, so this is pretty good, pretty sturdy, but just to prevent it from shifting, we're gonna put one fastener here and one fastener here. Now, you could use a normal drill bit just like we did before, but instead, we're going to use this bit. Focus, there we go. So this is a countersink bit. When we use this bit, it will allow us to make sure that the head of the screw sits flush and it doesn't stick up. So the other thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna need a way to drive the screw in without hitting the wall. And usually the drill has a certain amount of space around the bit. This is the distance from the chuck to the center line. So you can't make a hole all the way against the wall, you kind of walk it in an angle. However, we've got a cool tool, so this is an offset driver, so we can put our screw straight in, even though it's very close to the wall. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to use. What do you think half a 32 is? Um, like, uh, 16. How'd you come up with that? Uh, I, did, I divided 30 by, I divided 30 by 2 and then I divided 2 by 2. High five for awesomeness. Great job. All right, so 16 inches. So if I squeeze the trigger all the way with that on a one, you can see the little flutes turning, right? Mm -hmm. If I put it on two, it spins, it spins so fast that you can't see the flutes turning. So this is the gear ratio. One is slow and powerful, and two is fast and less powerful. Well, it's got a, um, you have to pull back on it to release the locking ball bearings, and then you can pick whatever orientation you want. So this is locked in here, but if I pull this away, I can rotate it over here, and now it's oriented that way. All right, then we can decide if we want to paint it or decorate it later, but I think the giant Lego table is open for business. What do you think, pal? Good. Well, thanks for joining us on this little project. Hopefully we'll do some more for y'all, and uh, have a great day. Bye. Bye.